My father died the day he thought he didn't have any more stories to tell me. I'm going to sleep next to him. You're not gonna bury him like that. You won't get him. I won't let you. I'll never open the door. Ah, the Orient, the voice of the Muazzin, the Umayyad's mosque, the smells of the souk, the hookah in the evening, mint tea, pistachios from Aleppo, ballet dancing, and pastries from the St. Thomas Games. Unforgettable memories. The kind that know at your soul. Just now, one of your ex-mistresses wanted to kiss your hands. I advised her to kiss your dick. <laughs> you never know. She might have brought you back to life. <laughs> she could have played Jesus and you, Lazarus. My father was a strange bird. He was born in 1933 in Salamiye, a town in Syria, a town filled with poets, writers, and communists. <laughs> a town with a temple where they worship Aristotle and Plato instead of Jesus or Muhammad. He admired Christ. He compared him to Guevara. He thought that he was handsome. And he'd say that a guy who offered wine at the wedding in Cana couldn't be all that bad. <laughs> I lived with my parents and my two sisters in a big house in Ayn al -Rimani in the middle of the Christian neighborhood. My father was fiercely secular. Throughout his life, he made sure that he lived only in Christian neighborhoods and that we went only to Catholic schools. See you soon, girls. I'm going to Iraq, where I'm going to open a pirate radio station. We're going to topple the Syrian dictatorship. We're going to start a revolution. One evening, two guys knocked on our door. It was the Iraqi secret police. Before he went to prison, my father said to us, I'm not going to leave you in the hands of these crazy people. Tomorrow I'm sending you to Beirut. I found a place for you at the school of the St. Joseph Sisters of Carmel. They're leftists! <laughs> for me, virginity is a bit like the guarantee of freshness on a package of uh, Maxwell House coffee. <laughs> In June 1982, the Israeli army invaded Lebanon to hunt down the PLO. The army had put West Beirut under siege to get Yasser Arafat to surrender. Planes were dropping leaflets. We have nothing against the Lebanese people. Our objective is to free you from the Palestinian terrorists. We had jumped over the tall weeds and the barbed wire fences before reaching the other side, West Beirut, in the middle of the smoking ruins of the buildings. There were no lights, no water, not even a crust of bread. But we were happy. We were home. In 72 hours, West Beirut would be hit with more bombs than any other city. I was crazy to live with a war photographer in the middle of a war. He lived the war in extreme violence. He was always on the edge of the abyss, but that's how he made his living. I had become a war addict, just like him. I'd spend my night in the West, in Hamra, at a club called The Backstreet. Coke was everywhere. I danced like a crazy. People were having sex in the jaws. They sniffed cocaine off the bar. In the parking lot, there was a blue station wagon with le red leather seats. It was for the couples who didn't like the jobs. The romantic ones preferred the Carrara marble tombstones in the Greek Orthodox cemetery. <laughs> but the dogs were something else. They'd run in packs. Each neighborhood had its own dogs. Their job was to eat the dead. At the end of the war, all the dogs were exterminated. They had eaten too many Lebanese. I was talking to my father when a dirty bomb fell right next to us. 
A loud burst of wind carried away the apartments, walls and windows in a split second. Our house would be destroyed seven times. It's strange, that need for violence. As if the violence of the war wasn't enough. We were criminals, almost as the killers themselves. We didn't have any weapons or machetes, but we were incredibly perverse. We pushed ourselves into the craziest things. The thing that's great about Russian roulette is the way the other person looks at you. He's surprised when you pull the trigger and nothing happens. It's unforgettable. I saw my father lying in his bag in a pool of blood. Everything was red. His clothes, the bag, the sidewalk. I thought he was dead. I told myself he is dead. Emergency services came really fast. He was still alive. After a week, they decided to put him in prison. They locked him in a cell with glass walls. They didn't torture him. Nobody dared touch him. He was too well known. But they had loudspeakers placed in his cell that broadcast the screams of the man they were torturing night and day in neighboring cells. It was too late, Papa. You were so busy in dreaming about my freedom that you didn't see how our country was losing its freedom. And now what am I going to do? You tell me. I thought about all these years, about your madness, about your dreams, your truth, and your defeats. They're breaking in, Papa. What am I going to do with your fucking freedom in this fucking country? Thank <laughs> you.